This is Bishop Michael Burbage, and you are listening to the Walk Humbly Podcast. Welcome to the Walk Humbly Podcast from the St. Clair Studio here in the Diocese of Arlington. I am Tom Shakely, Chief Communications Officer for the Diocese, and I am joined by our host, Bishop Michael Burbage. How are you doing, Tom? I hope uh, you are doing well, and all of our listeners, uh, as we are enjoying some uh, many blessings uh that continue from our golden jubilee and hope those blessings are pouring forth not only in our diocese but in the hearts and homes of all of our listeners amen 100 percent. we're going to talk more about uh so many of those good things the conclusion of our golden jubilee in just a few minutes um, but first uh we would be remiss if we didn't uh, address something that i think is on a lot of hearts and minds right now and and front and center in a lot of lives uh in the united states which is um, uh, it's hurricane season, Bishop, right? And, and yes. recently, Hurricane Helene uh, tore across the southeastern United States and impacted so many across so many states, uh, changed lives, took lives, um, and destroyed homes and communities. Yeah, very sad. Isn't it, Tom? We see the uh, reports and the devastation and the hurt and suffering. And uh, I have friends in uh, North Carolina, and uh, the devastation there in that area is, is very real. And uh, but like you said, acro- across the southeastern United States, and uh, certainly, uh, and we say this with a sincere heart, uh, we are united with our brothers and sisters uh, who have been impacted by this hurricane in prayer. I mean, that, that's the first thing we have to do is to entrust them to God's love and, and God's embrace. Uh, but also there are specific things we can do to help. Uh, we can each do our part. And that's why I invited the pastors to consider taking a special collection yesterday. And many of our parishes did this past weekend uh, so that we could directly send funds that we know will go uh, to support and assistance of those in need. Uh, Gifts will go to the immediate emergency needs uh, for necessities. Uh, We're talking about water. Uh, food, shelter, uh, medical care, and aid in long-term rebuilding and and recovery efforts. Uh, And and, and so sad. It claimed the lives uh, of so many uh, people with that damage. Uh, And so we will, you know, assist by our prayers and by the contributions we make uh, that will provide the support uh, that is so um, desperately needed. Yes, yes. Thank you, Bishop. I know you know there's so many ways to to support um, good relief efforts, and uh, this is of course taking place at the same time that you know this is not a one and done deal. Hurricane Milton, I know, is uh, it looks like it's going to impact Florida this week, and and who knows where that may end up. Yeah, I was talking uh, to a bishop friend in Florida, and it, it looks like Wednesday. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, is 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 an area of you know of some real concern. Yeah. So if you're listening uh, and you haven't already, or if you want to make another gift, you can contribute uh, directly to disaster recovery efforts. Uh, certainly, uh, as Bishop mentioned, a special collection was taken, and some parishes will do another collection this coming Sunday. Uh, but you can also go directly to Catholic Charities USA. Uh, we'll put a link in the show notes for that. It's just catholiccharitiesusa.org and find the recovery area for Helene in particular. All right, so uh, another uh, another bit of news, Bishop. Today, uh, literally today, is the one-year anniversary um, since the outbreak of significant hostilities uh, in and around the Holy Land. Uh, Pope Francis this past weekend led a rosary for peace at the Basilica of St. Mary Major in Rome. And uh, he asked, uh, in particular, I'll quote, he asked for uh, our Mother Mary's intercession, uh, asking that God, quote, uh, may transform the hearts of those who fuel hatred, silence the din of weapons that generate death, extinguish the violence that brews in the heart of humanity, and inspire projects for peace in the actions of those who govern nations, unquote. Yeah, and it's, a, again, a reminder uh, of what I basically I just said is that in amid such violence and uh, you know, as we record this horrific anniversary uh, where so many lives were lost, hostages taken, people tortured, uh, barbaric uh, behavior. Uh, and, and so we pray, uh, we can pray, and we do. We pray for the people of Israel and for uh, wherever these lands are torn apart by war and violence and hatred and evil. Uh, we are recording this uh, podcast on the day the church honors Mary under the title of Our Lady of the Rosary. And I had the great privilege of praying with our cathedral school students this morning. Yes. And we prayed for peace. 
I ask all the young people to do exactly what our Holy Father asks us to do, uh, to offer our rosary for peace uh, in our world, most especially in, in our nation, but in our hearts, and, and especially those uh, who uh, are, are leading and, and have the power to do good instead of harm. And because Pope Francis, when he says he has a special concern for peace, he says in what he calls our common home. Uh, this is our right. common home. Uh, but every prayer matters, and our learning to depend on God matters. So we want peace. We desire peace. We long for peace uh, for all those in the Holy Land and across the Middle East. We want a place for Christians who have been particularly driven out and marginalized over the past generation. We pray for their peace uh, and pray for the eradication of all such hostilities and, and violence. And, and we know this peace is only found in, in Christ, uh, in the Lord himself. But that's the gift he promised to give us. Uh, and so we are going to pray in, in joyful anticipation that it is the Lord who, who turns evil uh, and chaos into peace and serenity. Well, Bishop, uh, you know well that we prayed uh, in such a joyful way together as a diocesan family. This past weekend, uh, you know, as we mentioned in our initial comments about the, the culmination of our Golden Jubilee celebrations, uh, it was our diocesan pilgrimage to the National Shrine of the Basilica of the Immaculate Conception in Washington, D.C. It was, Tom. That was one of uh, the most joyful day uh, in my time as, as a priest and bishop. It was just, you, you know, when you go up to the altar, you reverence the altar as the celebrant of the Mass, which I did, and then I went to the presider's chair and looked out, and I literally got chills and teary-eyed. Because uh, I looked out and I saw over 3,500 people, I believe, from around the diocese of d every different age, to every different culture. And I saw the face. I saw the face of our diocese gathered together in one place. And I like, Lord, thank you. Thank you for the faith and devotion and the witness of all these beautiful people who came to this beautiful Basilica Shrine, Mary's home, with their prayers, with their with their hurts, uh, with their sufferings, with their special intentions, because they believe in you, Lord. They believe in your healing love. They believe in the power of, of Mary's uh, intercession. And it, it, was, it was throughout the day, it was just an incredible witness. Uh, 75 priests joined us as well. Uh, of our from our diocese uh, and confessions. I think we had 40 priests here in confessions. There were tours of the Basilica Shrine in six different languages. That's beautiful. Uh, we had mass. Uh, we had uh, people were praying the rosary together. We had Eucharistic adoration and procession and the blessing of religious articles. It was a pilgrimage, and a pilgrimage is a reminder that life here on earth is a pilgrimage. It's a journey. Uh, and we're all going, God willing, to the same goal, the same destination, heaven. But we have to help each other. We have to be with each other, encourage each other along the way. And we certainly did that as a diocesan family. And thanks to your, your wonderful team, uh, those who were not able to join us were able to participate. I saw the prompt postings of the photos and the different links. And I know we'll make them available as yes. well. So, you know, even from a distance, we were united in prayer and spirit. So I'm praying, Lord, that all these blessings that you bestowed upon us this past Saturday uh, will continue to bear fruit in this wonderful diocese. That's right, Bishop. And of course, we'll link to it in the show notes. But uh, you can, uh, whether you were there or whether you weren't able to attend, if you want to, uh, to live or relive the experience, you can go on to the uh, Diocesan YouTube channel. Uh, we'll link to the videos, uh, certainly a bishop of your homily from the Mass uh, at the pilgrimage, as well as the spiritual reflections, uh, both in English and Spanish. Uh, they're already up live on our YouTube channel. That's great. Thank you so much for that. Well, it's October, Bishop, and that means it's Respect Life Month. Uh, every month, in a certain sense, is Respect Life Month as Catholics, right? But October, in a special way, marks that in the United States. Uh, the USCCB's theme this year uh, for Respect Life Month is uh, from the Gospel of John, I came so that they may have life. Um, Bishop, you just celebrated our Respect Life Mass at uh, St. Ambrose yesterday, which sort of kicks off the month, right? Right, and it was a great day to be together um, uh, with the faithful of the parish and many from other parishes who were with us on Respect Life Sunday as we celebrate this month dedicated uh, for this special intention. And, uh, you know, 
providentially, yesterday's gospel also spoke about the sacredness of married That's love, right. the sacred union of husband and wife. And uh, I, I, I use the occasion to thank those present, but I'll use this podcast uh, to do the same, to express to all of our married couples uh, who are striving with the grace of God and help of Mary and Joseph uh, to live faithfully, uh, those promises they made to the Lord and to one another, striving daily to be holy families, uh, you are a great gift, married couples, uh, to the church and to your children and to those who love you and know you because you are a sign. You are a sign of the love that God has for us. We look at you and we see, yes, just like God's love, your love is faithful and permanent and fruitful and life-giving. Uh, so we, we thank you and, and we pray for you. And uh, during Respect Life Month, uh, we celebrate the Lord as the uh, source of life, our, our, our creator, uh, the one who created each one of us in his own image and likeness. His very spirit dwells within us. So all life is sacred uh, from the moment of conception uh, to natural death uh, because it comes from God. Uh, so we celebrate life. Uh, we respect life. Uh, but at the same time, Tom, uh, we have to acknowledge that uh, there are many uh, attacks against life. Yeah, uh, yeah. The, the taking of life. We we are we mourn knowing uh, every day uh, the child in the womb's innocent lives are taken through the horrific act of, of abortion, and and we know that uh, at every stage uh, there are threats against life. So we who respect life, we who celebrate life, we must also protect life, and we must defend life. Uh, and so I suggested yesterday three ways we might do that. And one is that we communicate the truth. Uh, there are some truths that can't compromise. You cannot no negotiate. All life is sacred. Yes. Everyone has a fundamental right to life. Uh, and no one can devalue the life of another human person. And so we have to communicate that truth. But we will be most uh, successful, effective, if we communicate the truth as Jesus did. Mm. Clearly decisively, without compromise, but always in love. Um, and so I think we are most effective when our message is uncompromisingly true and unfailingly charitable. Um, and we communicate the truth even in the darkest places. We can't just communicate uh, the gospel of life to those who agree with us. And, uh, <laughs> if only it were so Yes, <laughs> uh, and I'm sure that many in our um Dioceses uh, are well aware of what that's like to go to the darkest places. I hear. Yes. I hear from people. I hear what it's like to stand up for life in the workplace, and 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 the cost for that. Yeah. I hear from our college students what it's like to be on campuses uh, and to stand up for life and and fear of of being rejected or uh, ridiculed or even pay a price, uh, even from professors. Uh, yeah. So there is a cost, but that's what it means to, to be a disciple. We, we are courageous uh, and we, we we're steadfast. But you know, a beautiful way we, we protect and defend and celebrate life is by serving life. And we let everyone know that to be pro-life is to be pro-mother, is mm -hmm. to be pro-child, is to be pro-father, is to be pro-family. And we want to make sure we serve life and all mothers and fathers who are preparing to welcoming life. They want to welcome life, but maybe they're struggling. They're struggling with finances or just emotionally. We serve life by saying, you're not alone. We are here to support you. And we do. We do throughout our diocese. We do in our parishes. So many wonderful ministries, Project Gabriel, making sure if you're welcoming life, we'll help you. You need diapers. You need the basic yeah. necessities. You need food. You need housing. You need it. We'll help you so that you can welcome this life. So I want to thank everyone uh, who generously contribute to all the beautiful ministries that that support life. And of course, uh, you know, especially at this critical time, uh, we support, we protect, we defend life uh, by letting our voice be heard in the public arena. And this is a, an election, uh, this is uh, this time of, of, of election where because of the sacrifices of so many people, we live in a country where we're free and we can vote and our vote needs to count. Uh, and we have to, we wish we had candidates who checked every box, yes. you know, but we don't. 
but we have to inform our conscience and know that what is the uh, preeminent issue and priority is who will do the most uh, to protect our, 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 our unborn, who will protect the most vulnerable, yes. who will protect life. Uh, and we have to inform our, our conscience. We have to know the issues. We have to know the candidate. Uh, and we have to, and, and I encourage everyone, please vote. Uh, vote as a citizen, but vote as faithful citizens. Uh, and do so uh, in prayer. Uh, do so in, in prayer. And, and we do know every vote counts. So we, we also protect and defend life in the public arena uh, by exercising the sacred right that is ours. Yes, thank you, Bishop. It is, uh, it is a good reminder, too, a segue to uh, remind all those listening that early voting in Virginia is underway. And so if, uh, if you don't think you're going to be able to make it on Election Day, um, our, our Commonwealth gives you many opportunities to exercise that privilege. Well, uh, Bishop, there's been a, a, something kind of stirring in the news recently, which is uh, a kind of a long-simmering thing, the uh, prospect maybe of casinos in northern Virginia. So Virginia lawmakers and, and public officials have been grappling with this for a little while, but uh, former Representative uh, Frank Wolf, who represented the 10th District in Virginia, recently called publicly for the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors to publicly oppose uh, proposed legislation that's being proposed by State Senator Dave Marsden. Uh, and it would allow for a casino to be built anywhere in Fairfax County. Um, in previous versions of, of the uh, legislation, it's indicated Tyson's would be the likely location if a casino were to come to pass. Uh, I thought Frank Wolf's comments were interesting in particular because he said, quote, uh, casinos do not grow local economies and are not the answer to balancing local budgets. And he continued, in fact, casinos do considerable damage to local businesses and increase social costs in crime. Uh, I thought that was interesting because that's usually what you hear from advocates of casinos is to say, well, maybe it'll lower property taxes, maybe it'll increase business revenue, et cetera. And, uh, and Representative Wolf is speaking right uh, to that uh, idea. But, but Bishop, how do you think we should think about this as Catholics? Yeah, it's a very important issue. Thanks, thanks for raising this. And uh, I think that uh, probably most of our listeners, uh, myself included, uh, have been uh, know of family members and friends and loved ones uh, who were gambling. Uh, it has a, the power to become a, an addiction. Uh, an addiction that leads to, you know, dangerous uh, behavior in, in, you know, using uh, what is hard-earned money uh, in, for gambling purposes, and then upon losing that money, then are not you're not able to provide for what you should be using yeah. that money for yeah. in the care of your family, whatever. But I mean, just if I could just say, the church, as we know. Um, we, we tolerate, let's say, uh, what have historically been called games of chance, yes, uh, like card games and friendly wagers and, yeah. and lotteries. I guess um, we have to say bingo. I guess <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the kind of things you do with family, maybe Thanksgiving and Christmas. Yeah. Right? So, um, but the catechism states that games of chance become morally unacceptable when they deprive someone of what is necessary to provide mm. for his needs and those of others. So you, we see, we see the, the, the difference there. You know, yeah. uh, if you're having a friendly game of cards and you, you lose a quarter, it's not, it's not going to be yeah. that big of an impact. But if you're, you know, betting, you know, you're taking, you know, $500 or so, uh, you know, with you to casino and you end up losing it all, but that five hundred dollars was supposed to be for other purposes. Yeah, that was for rent. Uh, that was now, for now we can't we can't do what we're supposed to do and what we're obligated to do. Uh, and so the key point of the catechism made by the catechism is the passion for gambling risks becoming an enslavement. Uh, addiction mm. is a threat to our freedom. Uh, so I, I am one, and again, there's. I'm sure this is going to go to the community, and I'm a voice. Uh, I'm only one voice, but I, I don't see the need for casinos in Northern Virginia. Uh, but that's that's up to the community and elected officials to decide. But while we're talking about it, I do want to mention that sports betting and digital forms of gambling have exploded in the past five to ten years, where it is so easy uh, to bet. Uh, on your yeah, phone now. This is the DraftKings, like, the yeah, FanDuel, all yeah. that stuff. Yeah. 
over the silliest things, yeah. you know, like the flip of a coin or, or something like that. Um, and now you're like you're watching a game or a sports, which you're supposed to do to relax and to enjoy. But now you're holding your breath. You're tense. You're anxious because am I going to win this bet? Am I going to win this bet? Yeah. Am I going to if I lose, am I going to catch up? And and now, you know, you you, you lose that. And then it, it, it does. It has a power of really getting hold of you. Um, and I hear that from our young people. Yeah, I mean, they're, it, it's really, it's very alarming. It's very concerning. You know, I get, um, you, you see a lot, a couple of those uh, institutions you just mentioned that advertise oh, yeah. about how you bet. And then I guess they're required by law or something. But at the end, they say, if you have a gambling addiction, here's the number right. you call. You know what would be interesting? How about if they put that in the beginning? Yeah. And yeah. then put that warning in front. Now, who's really There's going to reason they listen? Go, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, uh, I, I do just, uh, I, I just invite our listeners uh, just to be careful here. You know, please be careful. Uh, we all, we all like good fun, and you know, we like to enjoy ourselves, and you, and, and things like that. You, uh, and and that's fine, but never when we're using. Uh, you know, the resources God has given us, hard-earned money for places that could put ourselves and family uh, in, in, in great need. Uh, so yeah. but just be vigilant, everyone. Just be prayerful. Just getting back to the casino thing, Virginia's a commonwealth, right? One of only a few in America. Uh, commonwealths were formed with a special focus on the state's responsibility. This is beautiful. To cultivate it it's virtue, an history, right? I yeah, love that yeah. history. Uh, so, state lawmakers, please don't forget this: that all legislation should make liberty the priority, understood as the freedom of all persons to pursue what is good and virtuous. Uh, so, let's pray on this. Let's think about it uh, and how we might always work towards progress in virtue and improving our communities. Well, there's always so much good happening here in the Diocese of Arlington, you know, Bishop, but we could especially look forward to two wonderful upcoming events. Uh, the first, uh, which we mentioned in a previous conversation, um, is the Hispanic Heritage Mass and Festival, uh, which is coming up real real soon. It takes place this Sunday, October 13th, uh, at the Cathedral of St. Thomas More. I love that. It's one of uh, it's a, one of my favorite events of the year to bring all of our beautiful faithful of our Hispanic community together. Beautiful mass uh, and a great festival, by the way. It, and it, everyone's heard, welcome. Yeah. It, this is this is for the whole diocese uh, to That's celebrate uh, the Hispanic heritage because it's a gift to all of us. Yeah. So, and if anyone's looking for a great festival, uh, this is really a good one, including the food and music. I have to say, I really enjoy that. That's great. Uh, we will be there. Well, the second is uh, our Mass for Marriage Jubilarians. Yes. Uh, again, this will be at the cathedral, and this is a, a week later, Sunday, October 20th, and you'll be celebrating Mass. I love that. That's another wonderful Mass. Uh, you, that's another opportunity. You, you know, you kiss the altar and you look out and you see all these couples married 25 years, 50 years, or even more. Wow. Like looking like newlyweds, like joy, you know, in their eyes as they look at each other. I look out and I'm like, what an incredible yes. example. And they always give me the number, which is like in the thousands and thousands and thousands of how many years of faithful married love are in the cathedral in, that day. Here. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I am really, I'm really looking forward uh uh, to to that mass as well. Again, it's for couples who have been married twenty five or fifty years or beyond. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. Well, Bishop, you know uh, we always welcome questions. Uh, anybody who's listening, anybody in the diocese who has a question for you, wants to ask it, can do so. Encouraged to do so. Uh, email info at arlingtondiocese.org or reach out to us uh, with a message on any of our social platforms. Uh, today's question is about uh, about Halloween. So um, the uh, the question is. Uh, Bishop Burbage, I'm a Hispanic young adult trying to live my Catholic faith. Halloween is a controversial topic within the, Spanish, the Hispanic community. When I was a kid, I always wanted to go trick-or-treating with the other kids at school, but my parents never let me. They said Halloween was demonic. I remember hearing uh, Hispanic priests and lay speakers speaking against Halloween. And now as an adult, the priest at my parish and my Catholic friends are saying that Halloween has Catholic roots and that it isn't sinful to participate in the holiday. So I'm confused. Uh, are Catholics allowed to celebrate Halloween? 
or is it sinful to engage even in things like trick-or-treating, eating candy, dressing up, uh, et cetera? Uh, would you be able to clarify this for me and other Hispanic families? Okay, thank you for that question. It's a very important question. So now you have me talking about don't have fun gambling. <laughs> <laughs> now, now I'm going to talk about Halloween. <laughs> but uh, no, it's, I'm only teasing because it's good to put this in perspective. And it is a very serious question. Um, and I really am, am grateful for it. Uh, first, a reminder for every good thing that the church blesses or permits, uh, know that the evil one will, even though it's a good thing, will try to uh, distort it or to warp it in, in some way. Um, I know a, a bishop in, in uh, Bishop Cordella of Tulsa issued a statement on Halloween back in 2018 that remains instructive. Um, and the Vatican News has also reported on this. Halloween, uh, the English word comes from two words in Old English. Hallows meaning holy and in meaning evening or eve. So Halloween mm. literally means holy evening, a wow. precursor to the feast of all saints the next day. That makes sense. Yes. So Catholics should understand Halloween uh, as a time to remember what we call, this is, this is the putting this in perspective, the four last things, death, judgment, heaven, and hell. So Halloween should be a time to remember that our lives, our actions matter because our actions shape who we become by God's grace, hopefully saints in heaven. So, bottom line, as Christians, uh, we can and should enjoy good fun, right? That's fine. Uh, key word is good. <laughs> and so that means being chaste and pure in how we dress, even the costumes that we wear, being respectful, not mocking others um, if we dress in, in, in costume. Uh, at the same time, there's no question the secular culture often treats Halloween as an occasion uh, to embrace uh, or, or revel in the grotesque or the sordid or the evil. So we must reject that, not not participate yeah, those, in that, those right? Those terrible lawn ornaments or the things, you know, just right. gory. You yeah, know, yeah. It puts your mind in a bad place. It puts your mind in a very bad place, and, and it takes us away from what it, what is good about Halloween. From and a holy evening. From right? a holy yeah. evening. That's yeah. a good way of saying it, yes. Um, so as long as Halloween has a spiritual effect of orienting us to God and to meditation on our lives and the lives of the saints, uh, we can say it is good to enjoy the holiday. Uh, so whatever we do, I think we should also mark our calendars for November 1st, the mm, Feast yes. of All Saints, which is a holy day of obligation, by the way. So, uh, but you know, a, a lot of, um, I know a lot of our schools and, and parishes are, are helping in this area. You know, that they're, they have the, uh, uh, what's that called? The trunk? Oh, trunk or treats. Trunk or yeah, treat, yeah. yeah, which is really great. You know, and the kids are all excited and they, uh, you know, get to maybe dress in their superheroes or many of them like in costume of the saints, which I love. Yeah, yeah. You have all these little saints walking around and, you know, and, and it's safe and it's in a nice environment and they you get, get to candy with your peers, right? and they have you know? fun. Like it's, uh, you know, we're not against fun. Uh, we're That's not right. against good traditions and things like that. Uh, but really, uh, it was a great question that was raised and, um, I think the church helps to put this all in perspective. Uh, fun is a good thing, but when we do it together with the right spirit um, and, and orienting us to, to all that is good and holy, it's a great thing. So, um, so I, Bishop Burbage is not against Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> it's not my favorite but holiday. But for the good. But, you won't uh, be surprised yeah, to hear it. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Thank you, Bishop. Uh, well, we've covered so much ground, right. uh, truly, uh, all over the world in this conversation. Thank, thank you, you Tom. Do you have any final thoughts? No, thank you, Tom. Was, uh, we did cover a lot, and we know that this is there's a lot going on um, in our world, in our nation, and we really have to be those witnesses uh, of Christ. Uh, we have the truth. Uh, we have to radiate it uh, in, in our example, in our words and deed. Uh, and I know throughout this diocese, uh, the faithful of this uh, diocese of Arlington do that so well. So, uh, dear friends, may God bless all your efforts and all that you strive to do to be holy witnesses, to have holy marriages and holy families. And I ask God's blessings upon all of you as together we encourage each other in faith and walk humbly with our God. 
Thank you for listening to the Walk Humbly podcast. Make sure you check out more episodes and all the podcasts our diocese offers on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and our diocesan website, arlingtondiocese.org. You can also follow me on X, formerly Twitter, at Bishop Burbage, where I provide a short gospel reflection each morning and on Instagram at Bishop Michael Burbage. Stay up to date with news, event information, and inspirational content by subscribing to our e-newsletter at arlingtondiocese.org.